Rob and Eric, it is so wonderful to have you join us on the podcast to talk about Strong. We are so excited about this. It's been a couple of years in the making. Eric and I have been going back and forth for a while, and now we're only about we're a couple of weeks away from the launch, so it's really fun. To get us started, because our, our listeners may not know who either of you are, let's start with some introductions. Rob, we'll, we'll kick it off with you. Yeah, so I'm Rob Kearney, uh, most popularly known as the world's strongest gay. So I'm actually the first and only openly gay professional strongman in the world. I compete in all the major strongman competitions worldwide, most commonly known for World's Strongest Man, that's seen on TV, the Arnold Strongman Classic, and other major events. And in my years of competing as a pro strongman, have also become a major advocate for the LGBTQ plus community, especially in the world of strength athletics. And my name is Eric Rosswood. I am a stay-at-home dad. I have two awesome kids and a wonderful husband. My oldest kid is eight years old and our youngest is three. And I'm also an author. I have two LGBTQ parenting books. It talks about the different paths to parenthood. Um, That one is Journey to Same-Sex Parenthood. It talks about adoption, surrogacy, foster care, assisted reproduction, Um, I also have another one called the ultimate guide for gay dads, which talks about the things after you become a parent, such as finding LGBTQ friendly schools, doctors, questions you may get asked that other parents don't get asked, things like that. And our children's book strong, which we're going to talk about today. Rob, you noted that strong was about a two year journey to come out. How did you and Eric join forces and, you know, essentially find each other? (laughs) <laughs> so it was right after I had broken the American log press record in 2019 at a competition in Leeds, England, and, you know, got a little publicity for that. And Eric actually saw the story online and reached out actually just via Twitter and said, I think what you're doing is amazing. The story you have is amazing. I could see this being as really inspiring children's book. Is that something you might be interested in? And up until that point in my career, like a children's book was never even on the radar. But it's honestly been probably one of the coolest things I've done in my career. Yay. (laughs) (laughs) What inspired you, Eric, to reach out via Twitter? Like Rob said, I saw the article about him breaking the record. And I just thought, oh, my gosh, this is amazing. And I looked for more information on it. And I wasn't really finding a lot of coverage about it. And I was wondering, like, why do more people not know about this? This is pretty amazing. I mean, you have this person that's breaking stereotypes of what it means to be masculine, strong, and gay, and all those things. And it was not getting the traction that I thought it it would be getting. And I also thought this would be an amazing story for kids. There are not very many real-life LGBTQ role models out there especially in children's literature and picture books. And I think that these kind of stories need to be told more, especially real life people. We need to see that there are people in our community that can do amazing things. And a lot of people don't know they can do something unless they've seen other people like themselves do it. And to me, that's really important. And I thought this was a wonderful opportunity to bring that message to kids. And that's a good segue. We've mentioned the book title, Strong. Tell us what this book is about. You know, really, it's about an athlete's journey of finding themselves and accepting themselves for who they are in order to achieve what they thought was impossible. The thing that I love most about this is when Eric and I were going through writing it, we wanted, I mean, Eric, it was honestly a lot of his ideas to keep it as true to my story as possible. I think Eric really describes it best, so I'll let him go into it a little bit more, but using color as a metaphor really is something that's so powerful in this book in terms of finding your inner strength and being who you are and what you can achieve once you accept that. Yeah. So Rob and I had a lot of conversations early on in the brainstorming process about which part of his story to cover and how to make it a story that would work well with the picture book. And I've heard a lot of people through my workshopping say they wanted it to be a coming out story. And what was really important to me was to not have it be a coming out story because I didn't want that to be an obstacle. We want to show people who are open about their sexuality and orientation and who are striving. And I think the metaphor idea really helped talk about coming out, but not be what the story was about. I think the story really talks about 
different ways to be strong physically, mentally, and being able to achieve your dreams when you can be your truest self. I think there's so many different layers to the story, and I'm really excited to see it come out. Pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that did strike me in that it's not the coming out story, which I think can make it even more universal because it's about embracing that true self, regardless of what it is really. And I think everybody needs that message these days, but especially the young people. Yeah, yeah. it's been interesting, you know, over the course of the, the last couple of years, you know, we briefly talked about it earlier in terms of book banning and everything that's going on in the country and stuff like that. And it's funny because obviously we're so, so excited for this book to come out. And I just got my copies of, of the book just this weekend and, you know, to hold it, feel it and really be able to soak it all in was such an amazing moment. And later on in the day, I was thinking, it's kind of cool that I might have a book that's going to be banned in some places. <laughs> it can't be a badge of honor, unfortunately. Yeah. You know, it, it, it kind of is. That's always how I've kind of went about my career because I, I deal with negativity on a daily basis via social media. But every time I see that, I always feel that there's no bigger middle finger to those people than my success. And that's kind of how I'm looking at this journey as well. It's interesting, the negativity I know you get on social media, but you keep pushing back against it. And I love the opportunities that have come up in the media where you get to stand there and just be seen as just somebody else. The thing that always strikes me when I see you on Strongman, which airs on CBS, I think each year since you've come out, I think Joey's been there in the crowd, maybe interviewed with you. They put the Chiron up, Rob's boyfriend, now Rob's husband, things like that. There's not a big deal made of it on CBS. It's just like, you know, Brian Shaw's girlfriend is there and here she is and here's your husband. And it's kind of awesome how that's manifested itself over the last couple of years. Yeah, they've just done such an amazing job of, I hate having to use this word, but normalizing it. Like, obviously there's nothing abnormal about it in the first place, but like I said, they've never had to go out of their way. And I think it says another thing that's so beautiful about the strongman community itself is we compete in this insanely hyper-masculine world of strongman, but everybody in the sport is so loving and accepting. And the first time I brought Joey to a competition with me, nobody batted an eye. It was just another weekend where we're with friends about to lift some weights. It's so beautiful to be in a sport like that, where there's no judgment. Well, the only judgment is if you don't lift a weight, not, not based on your <laughs> sexual orientation. So it's, it's really great to be in this community. I love how you just so nonchalantly say lift a weight. <laughs> <laughs> a car, pull a truck, whatever. Yeah. The opening illustration of this book is you pulling a fire engine. Just to give people an idea of what Strongman is for those who haven't seen it. Just a fire engine, that's all. Just a fire yeah. engine, that's all. <laughs> it was only like 42,000 pounds, it's fine. Yeah, no problem. What was the collaboration like between you two to write this book, as well as with your illustrator, Nidia Chiani, to really bring this book together between the words and the incredible illustrations? The collaboration has been wonderful. We talked a lot through interviews in the beginning, a lot of phone calls. And basically it started with me interviewing Rob quite a bit and getting a deep dive into basically his whole life to see which chunks of it we can pull into the story from being a, a young, young kid in uh, elementary school all the way to where he is now. We did, I would say, probably over 30 to 40 drafts of the manuscript. A lot goes into a children's book manuscript because you have to say a whole lot more with a whole lot less text, which can be a challenge. We went back and forth a ton of times trying to get the story right. And I think like the first draft of it, one of the main hurdles was Rob breaking his ribs. And I don't know if a lot of people know about that story, but he had an Atlas stone fall on him and basically break ribs. He came back better than ever. And he placed and was doing amazing. Unfortunately, that part got cut out of the story. I, I thought that was a pretty interesting thing to talk about. But we went back and forth with things like that. What should be in the book? What should not be in the book? And when we finally got it and had our wonderful agents work with Little Brown to get our story sold there, they brought on Nidhi Chanani. 
and Nitty is amazing. And, and she really worked the magic to bring the illustrations to life. We actually had a little bit more say in the illustrations than authors normally do. And that was one of the things that was really important to us because we didn't want to misrepresent the sport in any of the illustrations. We wanted to make sure they're wearing the proper gear. They are lifting things the way that somebody would look when they're lifting things. Also, we wanted to make sure that the illustration looked like Rob. I don't know if you've seen some of those statue revealings of Lucille Ball or <laughs> you know other people where it doesn't look anything like them at all. So we wanted to make sure you know Rob was happy with the way he looked. Joey was happy with the way he looked everything was represented the way it was supposed to be. And it honestly, it was a streamlined process. Everyone worked really well together. And I think part of it's because everyone really believed in the story and was excited to see it come to life. To me, it was like, it was such a fun process to go throughout the entire thing. You know, I mean, from getting each draft to making tweaks and changes to having the, the final, you know, manuscript complete and sending it off to to find an illustrator. You know, I think the funny thing is when it came time to find an illustrator, we got a list of names and there was some that I liked and some that Eric liked and some we'd kind of clash on. And Nitty was honestly the one where both of us were like, we had that aha moment. We're like, oh wait, no, this is who we need to do our story. We chatted with Nitty last week or so, and this is the first time she's done a nonfiction children's book and drawing muscles. So it was great to hear from her how she loved the challenge of the story, but just the way the characterization came out, the expressions, the emotion, you know, it really did bring our words to life. And I love how some of it is just, there's no other word for it, but cute. Yeah. <laughs> There's this one passage that for the first time I read it just really struck me as like just a wonderfully cute moment because it talks about that Rob can lift more than a fridge, a piano, or 800 stuffed rainbow unicorns, <laughs> or 114 <laughs> birthday cakes with chocolate frosting and confetti sprinkles. I mean, <laughs> I can't imagine you've had your weightlifting broken down in that way before. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is certainly a first. We talk about refrigerators and appliances all the time, but never stuffed unicorns and chocolate cakes. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of research on how much those things weigh. So. <laughs> <laughs> I don't doubt it, just to make sure it's right. Where were the differentiation points between telling Rob's story, but also getting the messages you want across? How did those two things come together? Because it is kind of a memoir, kind of an autobiography, but then you're definitely trying to tell story, but messages also. And to me, as a reader, it just all flowed so seamlessly to make the package. How did that all come together? I think one of the important things about telling a nonfiction story, especially for picture books, is to not just tell the facts. So Rob did this, and then he did that, and then he did that. And I think that those books can get kind of boring, and I think to find the heart of a story, some sort of emotion that the reader is going to be able to relate to, if you can really find that, I think that makes the difference between a book that someone wants to read once and something they want to read over and over again. And so I think it's really important when you're doing a nonfiction book is to tell those facts, but to tell it in a story mode that isn't like it's not making things up because it's not a fiction story, but it's telling the facts in a story arc. So for example, we put a lot of Rob's feelings in. So we were lucky to be able to do that because uh, a lot of nonfiction books talk about people who are no longer living, but we were able to talk to Rob and how does this feel? How does that feel? And then like what you were talking about with, he's able to lift these stuffed rainbow unicorns, these birthday cakes and things like that. It's taking the fact of what Rob is able to do and find a way that's more relatable to the reader. And so I, I don't know if very many like first graders, second, third graders are going to say, okay, how much does this fridge weigh? Or how much does this piano weigh? The, the fire truck. It's hard to really imagine that. But when you say a birthday cake, kids have held cakes before. They know what a cake is like. They know what a stuffed animal feels like. But when they can envision, oh my gosh, you have how many birthday cakes? How many of these unicorns? That That's more relatable for them in terms of, of weight. So it's kind of finding those things to make the, the reader say, aha, I can put myself in that story. And I could just imagine children all over the place now 
getting all their stuffed animals together somehow and trying to figure out if they can lift all of their animals together. <laughs> I would love that. That'd be amazing. <laughs> I will tell you, as soon as I read the draft to our son, he wanted to lift our car. So he was up there trying to lift it by the bumper. So <laughs> He went right for that... the car and didn't start with the stuffed animal. <laughs> no, didn't start with the stuffed animals. And to actually see that, it, it was an aha moment for me as well, because I was like, oh my gosh, this story really is relatable. Because one of the first things my son did was went and tried to do the things that were there. He wanted to be like Rob. And we are a big superhero family. We have superhero comic books everywhere, books everywhere, art, everything. And our son also used to talk about things like, I wonder if the superhero could do that or the superhero could do that. And I saw a couple of times that language shift to, I wonder if Rob Kearney could lift this, or I wonder if Rob could lift that. And then to me, that was my moment of, this is really resonating. And I think this is going to resonate with other kids in a similar way. There's so many positive messages within this book. I mean, it's not that many pages and not that many words, but there's so much positivity in it. I'm curious what you both want adults to take away from it, but also the youth to take away from it. For me, I think the message is kind of universal, whether you're a child, a youth, or an adult, is once you break down those barriers and you allow yourself to see yourself for who you actually are, then obstacles become really easy to overcome. And throughout this story, we obviously see my journey from beginning in strongman and not succeeding to finding someone who supports me for who I am on the inside and wants to bring out the best in me. And once I can see that for myself, I'm able to become a champion. I think that resonates across all age groups, especially adults. They, they are sometimes afraid to follow their dreams and passions and let people in on what they truly want to achieve. The story, even though it is a, a children's book, all of these things happened when I was an adult. So, you know, so I think everything is just really relatable in a, in a sense across all ages. I would just echo everything Rob said. I would add that I think it's really important for people to see themselves in the media that they are consuming, whether it's movies, books, music. And I think for kids to be able to see someone like themselves, being able to be successful, breaking records, doing things that they haven't seen before, that's really important. But I also think we talk a lot about representation and seeing yourselves in media, but I also think it's important for the people that are not LGBTQ to, to read stories like this as well. So they can see those stereotypes that might be in their minds already. It can help break those stereotypes. And I think that that can help with empathy and understanding. So I, I think these kinds of books are important for so many people to read. And like Rob, what Rob said as well, it, it's not just a certain age group. I think a lot of people can read this and, and get a lot out of it. I'd like to add one other thing, but Rob actually said to me that when he came out, it was like a weight was lifted off his shoulders. And I thought that was a very powerful message as well. We talked about seeing yourself in the media that you're consuming. I don't know if you've seen Encanto, but it's very uh, popular right now. And Luisa is one of the, the big characters who was resonating to a lot of people who was also strength and had a metaphor there about carrying the weight of the world and the weight of your family on your shoulders. And I know a lot of people resonated with that adults and children. And I think that that's going to be the same thing with this story as well, because it's more than just someone lifting something. It's how this is relatable about feeling that weight on your shoulders, feeling trapped or that you can't be your truest self. I, I think there's just so much with this story and if, if you liked Encanto and you liked that character, I think you're going to like Strong. I think that's a great comparison there. You bringing that up reminded me one of the things that I actually love most in the book is all the way in the back. It's the final line, Rob, in your reader note where you say, I hope I can inspire other young athletes to live by my motto, train to be the person they said you would never become. Yeah, I kind of came up with that mantra actually going into World's Strongest Man of 2017. It was my first year that I was invited to compete at World's Strongest Man. And up until then, it had been a long career of, of competing at lower classes, lower divisions, and different competitions. And 
all along the way, I was always told I, you know, was too small to be at world's strongest man. I wouldn't be able to be strong enough. And again, like I just, I used all of that as motivation to prove everybody wrong. So when we were getting ready for world's strongest man, they sent us this big info sheet and they asked us for like, what is an inspirational quote you live by? And up until that moment, I had never really lived by one that somebody else had already written. And I was kind of thinking about everything that I've gone through in my career to get to this point. And those words just kind of came to me in that moment. And it's really been, like I said, it's been my mantra and my motto since 2017. And even more so in this book, something that Eric talked about earlier in terms of just the representation in media and and sports and stuff like that. Up until I was competing at World's Strongest Man, I guess the best way to put it is I, I never thought that I was possible, right? Because you had never seen a gay strongman before. You had never seen, you know, I think all too often we see gay men represented in media in one way. That's the more feminine, flamboyant man. That's how we see gay men typically represented in movies and TV. And we don't see gay men competing in sports, openly gay men competing in sports, especially something like strongman. That's really one thing that, that I love that, that comes across in this story is, is it lets everybody know that sexuality and sexual orientation, it really holds no weight against what you can achieve in life. And having that as a message in the story has been really important. Hopefully this inspires the young athletes like you're thinking, but even collegiate and any other athlete who's kind of sitting on the fence about coming out. I think every athlete we hear from who comes out, regardless of sport, it's always like that weight lifts when they're their authentic selves. Exactly. We got some questions from a member of our Patreon community. And the first one that Sarah asks is this, what key pieces of advice do you have for fellow parents of queer children? And, and to that question, I'll actually add a little bit as well, especially within this calendar year, we've seen LGBTQ youth just bombarded by negativity. Even if you're not in a state like Florida or Texas, you still hear the broader message that's being out there. Eric, I'll come to you first. What is your advice to the parents and, and the adult allies really to make sure that the youth in their life are doing okay? There's so much to say about this um, question. <laughs> <laughs> Please say um, it all. <laughs> I mean, we don't have time to say it all. I think you bring up an important part. There is so much negativity right now. Mr. Rogers, I think, said it best. I, I can't think of the quote exactly, but uh, about looking for the helpers. So no matter how much negativity is out there, there's always people out there trying to help and trying to make the world a better place as well. So I think it's important for us to acknowledge that and look at the other side too. So surround yourself with people who are supportive, I think is really, really important to find the people who will be there to support you and your family, to listen to kids. And, you know, if they're having problems with something or struggling with something, it's important to listen to them and take in what they say and just try to be there as much as possible. The thing that I was talking about, about supporting and finding a supportive environment too, I think goes with trying to find supportive schools, understanding what's going on in the schools, understanding how you can be a champion for your children is very important too. Like I said, I can go on forever about this. So I'm just going <laughs> to cut myself there and see if Rob has anything to add there. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think it was, I saw a statistic from the Trevor Project that said it was, if there's an LGBTQ plus youth that has one, only one accepting adult in their life, it reduces their risk of uh, attempted suicide by almost 40%. I'll sometimes put these kind of statistics on my social media. And it's, I think, seeing those numbers and having things quantified opens people's eyes to realize how much at risk our LGBTQ plus youth really are at, especially now with everything so volatile. So I really do think to echo what Eric said is just like, being those people that will listen completely non-judgmental, you know, I still work in a high school and I obviously have a safe space on my door and the pride flag in my office and all that stuff. One thing that I've also done is I have a 15 second vent rule where I'll let the students come in, shut the door. And for 15 seconds, they can say whatever they want about whoever they want with no judgment. Then I cut them off 
And it just gives them that one outlet where they can just be completely free in the moment, air out all their frustrations with no judgment whatsoever. And having that, and I'm not saying like everybody has to do that. It's just something that I found has worked with the high school and middle school kids that I work with. And, you know, it really is just amazing how much just acknowledging someone can make them feel seen and change their world. I like to add something to that too. I I think that's so important because having that space where people can just have an outlet is so important. And kids from all ages, I mean, even from infants, they can see our reactions as adults and how things impact us. So they'll know whether or not we're uncomfortable about certain subjects. They'll be looking to see how we answer uh, certain types of questions and they will be able to see whether or not something is right or wrong based on how we respond to it as well. So I think it's very important that when we see things that are wrong, we emulate the behavior that we want the, the younger generation to see as well. So we need to be those types of role models who are going to say whether or not something is right or wrong, because they're going to see and hear us stand up for it. But they're also going to see and hear us when we don't stand up for it and when we're quiet about things. And those are things that they're going to recognize too. So if someone is constantly attacking a community and we are being quiet about something and the kids are only hearing one side of the story, they're going to start thinking something is wrong. So they need to hear the other voice that is saying it's okay. There's nothing wrong with being LGBTQ. There's nothing wrong with saying it in an elementary school. There's nothing wrong about talking about people who have same gender parents, all those things they they need to hear come from somebody that's a role model within their own community. And I think like, especially with me working in, in the school system, it honestly, I would say like, it makes me feel good about what's to come. I work in a town that typically leans very far to the right. We have openly transgendered students. We have a great LGBTQ plus community and support group in our school system. And all of those students, they use preferred pronouns and don't even blink about it, right? It's just normal to them because that's who that person is. Sexuality has never been an issue with anybody in the school. It's just like, oh yeah, those two people are dating. They just talk about it in normal conversation. And to be in a town that typically leans one way politically and to see those kids in those situations acting the way they are, you know, it just, it makes me excited to see that. Just that, that little glimmer of hope moment is really nice to see. Sarah had a couple more questions for you two as well. What would you both say to your younger selves if you could go back in time? There's a drag queen whose name is Priyanka from Canada who said it best, and it's just be gay. I struggled with my sexuality a lot growing up, and I was actually on a podcast the other day, and as I was talking about my coming out journey and everything like that, the two hosts talked about was my activity involvement when I was younger in terms of high school involvement, stuff like that, and I realized that being hyper-involved in almost everything I could get my feet into was kind of like a coping mechanism for me to not deal with the feelings I was having on the inside and not having to bring those forward. And I could just push them back because I had X, Y, and Z to do. I was always on the move. And I didn't come out until I was 22. And it was 22 years of a heteronormative lifestyle, 22 years of waking up every day and putting on this facade, pretending to be somebody I wasn't. And it was 22 years of exhaustion, to be honest. And it's really tiring to wake up every single day to think about how to act, think about how to speak and how to interact with your peers. And it's sad that it took me 22 years, but it also gave me a lot of perspective on things that I missed, things I would say. And I I would just tell myself, like, stop ignoring it. Because once you accept yourself for who you are, that's when you can actually experience true happiness. I'm going to say this question is a little bit of a paradox because we're not supposed to mess with the past because it impacts your future right so it would change yes, who we you are can tell today. you the superhero household there uh, not messing with time uh, i'm very happy with who i am today and if i changed the past i wouldn't be who i am today honestly though i think the the biggest thing that i would probably say is i'm going to go back to that fred rogers quote about finding the helpers i think there is so much negativity out there and it's going to come from us at all 
directions. And it's very hard to just not pay attention to any of it. But it's also very important to make sure that that's not overwhelming and taking over our lives. Finding the helpers, finding your community, finding the people who love and support you for who you are, they're out there. And I think it's very important to find them and focus on those people and to try to make sure that that outweighs everything else. Those people with all that negativity, they don't know you. They don't know who you are. They're just throwing stuff and regurgitating things from generations before or something that they've had from one small experience and they're saying that everybody is is like that and it's not going to stop and it's never going to stop so having those people who do love you and do support you in that positive message make sure it overbalances that and that's what makes things easier so many great things you said, said today. I just keep getting all this inspirational feeling coming off of what you're saying here. It's so wonderful. <laughs> Well, Rob's a very inspiring person too. So he helps uh, keep me in that positive direction. Everybody really needs a copy of this book. I can't emphasize that enough. Whether you've got children or not, the book is full of such joyful messages and inspirational messages. So I really hope everybody goes out and picks this up as it comes out. One more question from Sarah for Rob. What's a piece of lifting advice for someone who might be starting out with weights? The, so the biggest thing, honestly, is not to be afraid. I think. Everybody, when they go into a gym or they feel like they don't know what they're doing, they automatically have this anxiety, this negative self-talk that they just can't achieve it. And I think that's the worst place to start because when you're in a gym, you're working on bettering yourself. If for me, working out is a way of therapy. It's how I get my alone time. I, I get to work through my day, what's going on in my life, and I get to focus on bettering myself. And that's really all working out is. So I think honestly, the the biggest thing is really looking at what your goals are in terms of health and fitness. Is it to get stronger? Is it to lose weight? Is it just to be a healthier, fitter version of yourself? There are so many resources online in terms of the best ways to go about fitness and fitness is a science. There's no right or wrong answer. So You could do one thing for a few weeks and enjoy it for the first couple of weeks, then realize you hate it on the fourth. And then look at that. You can find something new and change it. That's the beautiful thing about working out. And then in terms of getting into strongman stuff, the nice thing about our sport is it is completely accessible for anybody of any size and any gender. So there are some great resources like startingstrongman.com where they actually outline, they have resources online, they have competitions you can sign up for. There's weight divisions for men and women. There really is just so much online, but it really boils down to not being afraid to taking that first step, jumping in the deep end, and always having that mindset that you're there to better yourself. I have to ask, as I was reading the book, I was just really wondering what it was like for you to see yourself drawn. Surreal. <laughs> Obviously, putting the story together and putting the words on paper was so much fun. And to seeing the story arc and seeing where exactly this journey is going, because Eric mentioned there was multiple edits and versions of the manuscript. But once we got to the point of having an illustrator and starting to really put this book together and have it come to life, it was so freaking cool. Like I said, I've done a lot of really cool projects in my life. I've done film, I've done commercials, I've done a lot of stuff, but having a children's book, it's one of those things that's just timeless. And to finally see it, and especially this weekend, hold it and flip through the pages. It's such just an amazing moment in my career. Yeah, it's just, it's wild. This is one of the few times, Jeff, that I don't have words. So you stumped me. (laughs) (laughs) Along with seeing yourself drawn, do you have a favorite illustration in the book? I 100% do. So there's this moment in the story where I'm in the gym and I'm back squatting and I look across the gym and there's this boy who just happens to be Joey. And the way that it came together in the story obviously was adorable. This kind of moment of these two men meeting and finding love and in the gym, and which is such a hyper-masculine place, which you normally wouldn't see that happen. And then the way Nidhi really had it come to life is just so amazing. And yeah, that's probably my my favorite illustration in that moment. It's kind of halfway point of the book where I'm competing, but then I find this support system in this guy and he ends up being the reason for my success. 
Yeah, I have to say that actually is one of my favorites as well. As I was reading the book the first time and I turned the page, I was like, oh, Joey's in it too. <laughs> I was just so overwhelmed in that moment. That representation came into the book as well. Because, I mean, I could envision a version where that isn't part of the story and what you're trying to tell. But to see it there, I was just, it meant the world to me that that was there. And I think it's just, it's just so beautiful. Cause like Eric said, it's not a coming out story, but being gay is a part of the story. And to be able to show that relationship and that support between these two men that love each other, I think it speaks volumes to how the story really came together to not make it, even though it's a moment in the book, it's not the overarching message that we're really looking to get across. Yeah, exactly. Eric, do you have a favorite illustration in the book? Oh my gosh. I think Nitty is just wonderful in what she was able to create. There are so many special moments, I think, in here. For example, when we're, we're talking about Rob's younger life, about being sturdy like a boulder and the way that she was making the boulder behind and feeling powerful like a rocket. And she actually drew Rob in space. And I didn't envision Rob being in space, but it's pretty cool. And I think it, they're just things you really have to look at to see because it's so imaginative and expressive and her artwork added so much power to the words. I love it. My favorite illustration though, is the fire truck pool, because I think when you're reading the story and you just turn the page and you see this massive fire truck going across both pages on the big spread, it's just a wow moment for me. And I think that it's going to be a wow moment for a lot of other kids too, because it's just very much in your face, this massive fire truck. And it's, it's just hard to imagine someone being able to pull such a huge giant vehicle. And I think it's exciting and empowering. And I think kids are going to love it. A special thing that Nitty did for me is she actually uh, drew my family in that illustration as well. So there's an extra bonus to that's not why it's my favorite one, but I'm excited. That's the one that she offered to put us in. That's awesome. I won't tell you where we are, but it, you'll have to find it. It's like, where's Walden? I love that fire truck picture. The pull is one of my favorite events in Strongman. And fire engines, train locomotives, 18 wheelers, I think airplanes I've seen one year. Yeah. It's so symbolizes Strongman to me, even though I suspect for most it's the Atlas Stones, but that pull is what does it for me. So to see that on that opening spread was just awesome. Well, it's one of my least favorite events. So if you want to hop in for me at World's Strongest Man this year, Jeff, feel free to tag in. Because <laughs> being the smallest competitor, it doesn't work to my advantage sometimes. <laughs> I don't see how anybody honestly starts that. I mean, even the heaviest <laughs> of the strongest men, how you get going from a full stop on that, I mean, it defies <laughs> physics to me somehow. <laughs> But no, you don't want me tagging in for you because you will not even take a step. <laughs> how does Joey feel about being drawn into the book and how he looks in there? I imagine it's got to be pretty cool for him, too. Obviously, with all the versions of the story and then how it ended, we were kind of interested to see how it would come together. And we got to that moment where Eric and I really realized that Joey was going to be a pretty big part of the story, you know, having that conversation with him was, it was a lot of fun because he's definitely one of those people that even though his personality is completely infectious and he's adorable, he likes to try to stay out of the limelight as much as possible. So when he had the moment that he had that realization that he was going to be in the book and being drawn and characterized, he was a hundred percent on board. And to see it all come to life again, especially when we got the copies just this past weekend, it was a really special moment to be standing there next to him and flipping through the pages and us reading the story together, seeing ourselves on the page. And it was really beautiful and so exciting. That's awesome. Now, just a couple of weeks after the book comes out and after this interview goes out, May 24th through 29th. Rob, you're going to be competing World's Strongest Man 2022, actually right in our backyard in Sacramento. How are you feeling going into this year? I'm feeling good. I, I just came off a great performance at the Arnold Strongman Classic at the beginning of March, where I took fifth place. 
So we're eagerly awaiting our qualifying groups as world's strongest man. There are 30 athletes that go, we're each split up into one of five qualifying groups. So we're kind of waiting to see who we get paired with, but overall, my training has been great. I feel really strong. I feel healthy. Obviously my body aches and hurts every day because of what I put myself through. But that means that makes me realize I know I'm doing something right at this point in the training. So I'm really excited to get out to Worlds. This is my first time back since 2019. The past couple of years have had a few injuries that I've been dealing with. So to be healthy, to be feeling strong, pun intended, and ready to go for World's Strongest Man, I'm really excited to get back there. Looking forward to seeing you compete. So besides Strongman coming up shortly, Rob, what should people be looking out for you for like through the rest of the year and stuff? Any book tour plans or anything people should be paying attention to? <laughs> So yeah, we're, we're currently planning some book appearances and we don't have everything nailed down a hundred percent, but once that's squared away with our publicist, you know, we'll definitely be, you know, shouting that out from the rooftop so everybody can come see. And other than that, it's honestly a lot more competitions. That's, <laughs> that's a lot of what my life entails now. Uh, so I'm actually going to be competing in London in July at the Royal Albert Hall at the Strongman Classic. And hopefully later this year down in Austin, Texas at the Rogue Invitational again. So those are kind of the two big competitions I have coming up after World's Strongest Man. And Eric, what should people be looking out from you? I think right now, all of my focus is on strong. I am very, very excited to see it come out into the world. Um, very inspired by the message. And I really hope a lot of people get to, to read it. And I know Rob talked about book bans as well earlier today. And I think you brought it up as well. It's a double-edged sword if books do get banned. I mean, some of those books may see a little bit of a spike in sales, but I'll, I think the trouble with being on that list is a lot of people who actually need to read those books don't get the opportunity to read them. They don't get to check them out at the library. They don't get to see themselves in those stories. So I think if you live in a place where there are these book bans or if people who are impacted by these book bans, if there's any way we can help to make sure that those kids can get the books that they need um, so that they can see themselves represented, whether it's Strong or any of the other books that are on that list. I know there's a lot of great books out there that kids can read all the way from picture books to YA. So it can be graphic novels. It can be middle grade books, young adult books, picture books, all of them. Every grade level needs to read it. And there's nothing wrong with saying someone has two parents of the same gender in first grade or kindergarten because all the kids are drawing pictures of their families. So those kids need to be able to see that it's okay as well. Yeah, it's, it's, it's so important that the books get out there. It's been inspirational to see the stories of people who find out about the banned books and then go off and buy a bunch of books to get them into the hands of the people who should be reading and need to be reading those books. Yes. So in addition to me helping get the word out about Strong, I also am trying to focus on highlighting other LGBTQ books as well to make sure that they get seen. I know some books came out during the pandemic, so they didn't get the marketing that they need. So the word wasn't really out there about those books coming out. So just trying to highlight LGBTQ kid lit is very important to me right now. Are there a couple of books you'd like to shout out here that either our listeners might want to pick up or to make sure that they get them into the hands of perhaps their loved ones or something? Oh my gosh, there's a lot of picture books that are coming out right now. One that just came out, I think in January, is called Love Violet. It's a picture book about young love or being able to tell someone that you like them and feeling nervous and having those butterflies in your stomach. It's probably the most adorable, cute little love story that I've seen. So I would definitely say get that one. There's a whole bunch of other books coming out for Pride that I think are picture books. I just want to shout them all on the rooftops. There's Cinderella, Little Miss Hot Mess has a few. If you're drag queen and you know it, I think it's coming out as well. Of course, Strong. There, there's a lot. I'll tell them to you if you want to put them in comment section. <laughs> yeah, give us a list and we'll definitely put them in our show notes. Good. Kind of like your book recommendations, if you will. We'll have a section for that in the show notes. That'd be great. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And Eric, how can people keep up with you online just to follow what you're doing and see what comes next? You can go to my website, which is Eric Rosswood. That's R-O-S-S-W-O-O-D.com. Um, I'm on Twitter, LGBT underscore activist. I'm probably most active on Twitter. It's probably the best way. And Rob, how about your social media? 
For me, I'm pretty easy to find at World Strongest Gay on most platforms, uh, Instagram, YouTube, and that is also my website as well. I'm most active on Instagram. And that's where I keep most of my life on that social media platform. Uh, and we'll keep you up to date on everything going on. Well, Rob, we wish you all the success at World Strongest Man this year. And Thank Eric you. and Rob, all the success was strong. It's such a wonderful book with a great message. Thank you for putting it out into the universe. And thank you for being here. Well, thanks Thank for you having, having us. us.